Stanford University. Uh, it's an exciting time to be thinking about some of the ethical and legal implications of neuroscience, particularly because of all of the exciting work that all of you are doing um, and that everybody in the neuroscience community is doing. It's impossible for me to give you a full overview in a quick period of time about the ways in which neuroscience is already finding its way into the courtroom, into legal decision making, into policy decision making. So what I want to do is just provoke some thoughts and some conversation to start uh, to introduce you to some of the ways in which neuroscience for good and for bad is informing a lot of what's happening uh, in legal and ethical conversations. And so I'm going to give you just a brief flavor of the ways in which neuroscience is being used in criminal and in civil court cases uh, to give a sense of the ways in which basic neuroscientific research and neuroscience of differences between individuals is being used, and then shift a little bit to some of the even more controversial uses in legislation and being used to advance different policy agendas of different groups. Um, and finally, just talk about some of the broader implications of thinking about different ways in which we can better access our brains and better access ourselves, and the kinds of questions that that's leading people to ask in philosophy and in ethics um, and in law more broadly about privacy and dimensions of privacy that may be reawakened or uniquely awakened by neuroscience. But to begin with, I want to tell you a little bit about the ways in which neuroscience is being used in criminal courtrooms. So, the claim, as I like to describe it, looks like this, which is my brain made me do it. And for all of you in this room, the answer should be, well, of course, your brain made you do whatever it is that you're coming in and complaining about. But the idea is a little bit different, which is to say um, there's something unique about my brain, some abnormality, which helps to explain why I'm more violent than most. I'm more likely than most to be impulsive. I am less likely to be able to form intentions in the ways that you mean in criminal law. Um, and in criminal law, we require that for every thing for which you are convicted of, that there be a voluntary action and that it be done with the requisite mental state. But what exactly do those terms mean, voluntary and mental state, particularly from a neuroscientific perspective, are the legal fictions that we've devised, ones that continue to make sense in light of knowing more and more about human behavior. What you're looking at here is a chart for empirical research that I've been gathering from 2005 until more recently 2013, but this shows you through 2007, 2012, which we've analyzed. And what we've done is look at judicial opinions in which judges talk about the use of neuroscience in the criminal courtroom. In particular, when an individual comes in and makes a claim about their brain. Now, there's many ways you could make a claim about your brain, of course, right? Psychological theories have come into the criminal courtroom for a very long time. What I'm looking at specifically is when language about the brain itself is invoked. So people do things like introduce some sort of brain scanning, like, an, uh, like fMRI, although that hasn't really shown up in many court cases yet, but EEG, spec scans, things like that. Um, or they claim that they suffered some sort of major head injury and that before the head injury they were a normal compliant member of society, whatever that means, and that after the head injury they were far less normal and compliant and that they committed their criminal act in response to their brain making them do it. The idea is that there's something different about conscious decision making. There's that little homunculus in the brain and when the homunculus in the brain makes a choice, that's far worse than when the brain without the homunculus makes the choice. That's the concept. And what you see in this chart is that that claim is increasing. So a little something you should know about criminal law, which is 90% of cases in this country don't go to trial. 90% of them are resolved in plea bargaining. Only about 10% go to trial. Of the 10% that go to trial, only about 1% end up being appealed. And of the 1% that end up being appealed, not all of them end up with judicial opinions that talk about all of the evidence that was at trial. So I'm looking at a tiny little snapshot of the universe because it's impossible to get trial level data. And in that tiny little snapshot of the universe, there's about 1,600 judicial opinions that talk about criminal defendants coming into the criminal courtroom and saying, my brain made me do it in this period from 2005 to 2012. And it's increasing year by year. And there's a little dip in 2012 because Primarily the way this was originally being used was in death penalty cases. We're unique among many countries in that we still have the death penalty. And 
When we have the death penalty, you have a separate proceeding, a capital proceeding, during which you can introduce a lot of evidence to try to say, have mercy on me, treat me differently than the worst of the worst offenders. And so oftentimes it would come in in that context. We're starting to have a decreased number of death penalty cases in this country because of a lot of moratoriums across the country. So there's a commensurate decrease. What's interesting is many things, but one of the things that's interesting is that it's not just people who have committed murders and not just people who've commit, but committed capital murders, that is, cases in which the prosecution seeks the death penalty, in which people are raising the argument, my brain made me do it. What this chart here shows you is the kind of claim that a person raised when they came into the criminal courtroom, sorry, the kind of charge that they had when they came into the criminal courtroom. And it's by the most serious charge because a lot of times criminals do a lot of bad things at once together. It's not just one thing that they do, and so we charge them for a lot of things together. And you can see the biggest category is murder, but the second biggest category is drug offenses, one of the largest areas in which we actually bring people um, into the criminal system. But if you look down the, the slide here, you'll see things like child abuse or rape or fraud. My brain made me intentionally defraud you. <laughs> Literally, this is the kind of claim people are making. And what a case looks like is it'll have somebody who will come in to the criminal courtroom and they'll say, OK, I get that you have me down for Medicare fraud, where I have up-coded each and every single time I've seen a person, and that I've instructed my staff who does the coding to do so in order to maximize the amounts of Medicaid or Medicare reimbursement I'm getting for that or insurance reimbursement. But the reason I did that is because I have this problem with the frontal lobe region of my brain, which makes me more likely to have poor judgment. And that poor judgment is the reason I defrauded the government, not for any bad wickedness. And therefore, you should hold me less accountable for my crime. OK, now that sounds a little silly, doesn't it? It's a little bit silly. and yet. It's the kind of claim that's being made and it's putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the system to figure out, okay, well, why do we hold people responsible? What is the purpose of responsibility? What's the purpose of the criminal justice system at all? And it's not so much that neuroscience is fundamentally challenging things that we already knew, which is many criminals have something wrong with them, right? And many criminals have some reason that we should be concerned about simply sticking them in prison. But it is leading us to ask these questions. And we're asking these questions in every phase of trial because while it originally came into sentencing, if you think about the criminal process as three different phases, the pre-trial process, where a lot of things happen, like trying to figure out if a person is competent to stand trial, there's a lot of, a lot of cases now where defendants are coming in and using neuroscience to try to show that they don't have the competency to assist in their own defense. Or, for example, they don't have the memory intact to be able to adequately identify witnesses who would be helpful in their defense or adequately prepare their defense attorney. And that can be really quite powerful evidence. And it turns out that's a really effective place in which neuroscience is starting to inform the criminal process. Or in the guilt innocence phase, what do we mean to act voluntarily? In criminal law, we have the thinnest possible definition. We couldn't figure out what it meant, so we came up with a list of what counts as involuntary. And what counts as involuntary is something like a reflex or a convulsion, and then everything else is voluntary. But in neuroscience, you're trying to figure out what does it mean to act voluntarily? What does intention mean? Can you see intention before you actually see the motor action? And then criminal defendants are coming in to say, look, here's the evidence that shows all of the decisional processes that happened before you saw the action, which means I didn't do it, my brain made me do it. It wasn't a voluntary action. And it's causing quite a conundrum in the legal system because we're being forced to come up with thicker and better definitions of what we mean by voluntary. And what role that actually serves, what's the purpose of actually holding somebody accountable for a voluntary action or a mental state. The gradations of mental states in criminal law, the worst kind of mental state you can have is to do something purposely. What does it mean to do something purposely? It means it's your conscious object to engage in some conduct, and it's your conscious object to bring about some result, as opposed to acting, acting recklessly, disregarding the consequences of your actions.
Well, is that the worst kind of behavior? And is there a real difference in the brain between that? All of these new studies about thinking fast and thinking slow and trying to understand how quickly decision makings actually occur. If you make decisions faster than the conscious awareness of those decisions can keep up with, is that really purposeful kind of conduct in the way we've meant it in criminal law? Or does it mean something fundamentally different? And judges are asking these questions. And they're confused. They're confused about what the neuroscience means. They're confused about what the theory and law means. And they're struggling with these. And so there have been a series of judicial seminars across the country to try to help give them basic neuroscientific evidence, help them understand when it's bad science that's being introduced into a courtroom, which it often is. We're writing a brief right now about the use of QEEG in North Carolina in criminal cases. And the consensus seems to be that's bad science. And yet, how do judges figure that out? How do they know they're not trained for this? And trying to figure that out is a problem, and it's essential that more neuroscientists are willing to engage in that process. And it's leading people to say, what does free will mean, and what role does it play in the criminal justice system? What does it mean to be a responsible actor? Do we really have any sort of control over our preferences and desires and who we are as people? Do we at least have some control over action choices that we make? And if we're holding people accountable for crimes and stigmatizing them, and yet they have very little control over preferences and desires, does that matter? Some of the most interesting cases in criminal law involve major shifts in behavior that happen before and after, for example, the development of a brain tumor. And you'll see a person who normally would comply with, with their conduct, with law, then they start to act in an incredibly aberrational way. They commit some horrific crime, they kill somebody, or they commit an act of pedophilia or some other type of harmful act. And then in the process of the work up to trial, we discover that they have a brain tumor. It's removed. Their behavior goes back to the way they were before the development of the brain tumor. Is that person responsible for what they did during that time? Well, it's hard to know because we don't know fully what it means for a person's behavior to develop a brain tumor. And certainly there are plenty of people who develop brain tumors who don't act that way. Is the mere fact that it was inconsistent with the person's behavior before and after they had the brain tumor sufficient reason to not hold them criminally responsible? And that leads us to ask questions like, well, why do we punish to begin with? It really depends on why we punish for what we do with that person. Do we punish to rehabilitate people? This was the theory in the 1960s in this country, was let's bring people into the system and rehabilitate them, give them job skills, give them mental health training. But it both didn't work, and there was very little appetite for people to divert resources for prisoners as opposed to our education systems or you know, for other types of social benefits that might more broadly benefit people in society who haven't committed a crime. And so the appetite for rehabilitation hasn't been strong, but maybe it's starting to be reawakened as we understand more and more how many people may have some sort of neurological problem or other problem which helps to explain, at least in part, their criminal conduct. Or do we punish for purely retributivist reasons? It'll take you a moment on this cartoon, but it's worth just pausing <laughs> to think about retribution, okay? Is it an eye for an eye, okay? Is that the reason that we punish people? And if that is the reason we punish people, is a person fully morally blameworthy if they have a brain tumor which developed and their behavior changed? Or if they just grew up in a particular way where they suffered a head injury as a child because of childhood abuse, or they just simply have a different brain, something different? Well, we don't know enough in neuroscience to really be able to answer those questions fully, but it's leading people to ask this question of what does it mean to hold a person accountable for their action? Or do we put people behind bars simply to make all the rest of us safe? Okay, do we do it because we're afraid that they're gonna reoffend? In which case, if that's the reason we do things, isn't this just a double-edged sword? If you come into the criminal courtroom and you say, look, my brain made me do it, I have very little control over my actions, and the truth is, I am impulsive, I'm more aggressive than most, I'm more violent than most, I am programmed to be more addictive than most, or more of a pedophilia than most. Does that lead a jury to think, aha, we should put them back out on the streets then? Or quite the opposite, does it lead them to have a sentiment that what we really should do is lock them away for as long as possible? 
And in fact, that's what you see in a number of criminal cases is the jury starting to go the other way, starting to think that unless you have a compelling treatment answer to this, unless it's you have a brain tumor, you removed it, your behavior is now different, or you have this aberration, which this kind of medication or this kind of treatment can actually resolve, it may be worse for the criminal defendant to introduce this evidence, which is why prosecutors are capitalizing on it and starting to use it to argue, if your brain made you do it, then you should be segregated from society to safeguard the, race, the rest of us. But it could cut the other way, too. We've started to think about people as categories of individuals in sort of gross overgeneralization ways. The developing brain theory and the amount of neuroscientific research that has gone into understanding the brain and its development and its likely implications for human behavior has shown up in a number of criminal cases. And so for purposes of sentencing, it's now unconstitutional to execute an individual who's under the age of 18 relying upon and incorporating neuroscience and the developing brain theory as a basis for saying that juveniles are different in kind. Okay, they're different in kind because their brains aren't fully developed. They're more likely to succumb to peer pressure. They're more likely to follow rather than to lead. They are more likely to change over time. Okay, so they're unlikely to be the kind of wicked person forever that you may think an adult criminal may be. And so it's led to a series of additional questions like can you give them life without the possibility of parole? And the answer is no. The US Supreme Court referencing specifically to neuroscience says you cannot give them life without the possibility of parole when they commit non-homicidal offenses. Nor can you give them a mandatory sentence of life without the possibility of parole when they commit a homicidal offense. You have to individually consider their developing brain. Now that's fascinating to have a United States Supreme Court mandate that you have to consider a person's brain in sentencing. Think about how little we understand about the basics of the human brain and how it affects an individual's behavior. It's now a constitutional rule, at least for a category of people, that it has to be taken into account. And it's come up in other contexts too, like should they be transferred to adult court, should they not be transferred to adult court. There's a lot of implications for what happens. And it's not just the criminal context. It may have powerful results in trying to substantiate things we could never see. One of the significant difficulties in the civil context for a plaintiff who's been injured is to be able to prove their injuries when you can't see them. They don't have lacerations. They don't have broken bones. They're suffering from extraordinary pain or emotional suffering. And starting in a few years ago and more recently now, there are a number of times in which neuroscience has been brought on to show invisible injuries to try to give objective proof, as if neuroscience holds the truth to all of the things that we've wanted to know before. Okay? We're just starting to understand what pain is or looks like in the brain, and it already is in criminal courtrooms, or showing signatures of a toxin on the brain look, this person really was exposed to this toxin. Here's the evidence of it. The proof is in the image. And images can be powerful for juries, especially ones who don't understand them that well. And this idea of physical pain is really powerful. I know some of you work on trying to understand touch and perception and pain. There was the study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 looking at the difference between physical pain and emotional pain and intensity of pain. And sure enough, that's information that's been incorporated already into some tort cases to try to say, look, if they don't have evidence of their pain, they could have, so they must not be in pain. Or here's the evidence of them actually being in pain. But it's not just the civil context in which pain shows up. Pain turns out to be a powerful catalyst for a number of different categories of legislation, and one in particular which is fetal pain legislation. Okay, at least a dozen states since 2010 have enacted some sort of legislation that tries to shift when a woman can have an abortion based on a theory that the fetus experiences pain. In Roe v. Wade, the United States Supreme Court recognized a privacy interest for women to choose to bear or beget a child. And they tried to balance when that could occur. And the way that they balance when that could occur is by a standard known as viability. But viability is a shifting standard because medical technology has shifted when a fetus is viable. And 
The reason they chose viability is something called the compelling state interest. It's when the state's interest in the developing life is strong enough to trump the interest of the mother, such that that interest outweighs the interest of the mother to bear or beget a child. And so what a number of states have started to do is to say, well, there could be other compelling state interest. It doesn't just need to be viability. And maybe a more meaningful one would be pain. When does the fetus experience pain? And if this p the fetus experiences pain at an earlier date than the date of viability, which has traditionally been at the end of the second trimester, although that, again, line is shifting, then they could move it forward earlier. And so a lot of states have chosen 20 weeks as the date at which a fetus feels pain. But then, of course, neuroscience comes into play. What is pain, right? What is it? And when do you feel it? And do you need thalamocortical connections in order to experience pain? Is there a difference between nociception and perception? And so there was a powerful multidisciplinary review that was published in JAMA, which many people think is an excellent piece of science, but it's also incredibly politically motivated as a piece of science. It's a piece of science that tries to look at when is it that thalamocortical connections actually happen? What is pain? Is there a difference between the perception of pain versus non-perception of pain? Now, why should we care when it comes to the fetus? Why should it matter? If there is a reaction to pain without an experience of pain, does it matter? Well, it all gets bound up in this concept of what is personhood? What is personhood? And does personhood begin when you can experience pain or any other sensation? Is pain just simply something that we stand in for the perception of any kind of experience whatsoever? And is the point at which there's something called perception the point at which the compelling state interest should kick in. So there's this great table that's in this article that looks at the various points at which different systems come online. These aren't done in human fetuses, they're done in animal models. And the few studies of human fetuses that have been done can't confirm when all of this actually comes in online in the developing fetus. It gives us some evidence of when it happens, but does it tell us when personhood begins? Does neuroscience hold the objective truth to what has been one of the most challenging and divisive issues in this country? Probably not. These are normative questions. And neuroscience can't answer normative questions, but it can help inform the debate. And so this chart has been used to try to be the answer to the fetal pain legislation. No, 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 you've got it wrong. It turns out that 30 weeks is about the time that perception occurs, the thalamocortical function actually occurs, in which case you move from nociception to perception. And once you move to perception, that turns out to be about the same time as viability, and it might be a stronger line that would suggest we should do it at a later period of time. This is a debate that's happening in court cases as people challenge this legislation as putting an undue burden on women in their right to choose an abortion. And it's leading to these opinions where judges, again, are having to grapple with what does the neuroscience say? Does it matter? And then does it inform the normative question of what does it mean to have a compelling state interest? It can't answer that question for us. Science can't answer questions in law for us of why we hold people responsible or why we choose to draw the line in one place or another, but it can inform the debate. And if it's going to inform the debate, we have to educate people so they understand what the state of the science is. What does it actually tell us? And then we still have to do the hard work of deciding what does that mean? Even if we know what the science is, what are we going to do with it as a society? And of course, this ties in from the beginning of life to the end of life. Right? The fascinating studies that have been done on consciousness, particularly in people who perhaps were misdiagnosed as being in a persistent vegetative state, but some of them may in fact be in a minimally conscious state rather than in a persistent vegetative state, have led to questions of, is there such a thing as a neural marker of consciousness? Well, philosophers would love the answer to that question because for centuries we've been trying to figure out what does it mean to have consciousness? What is conscious awareness? And if it turns out there's some neural signature of it and we might be able to find it in the beginning of life and the end of life, maybe that's going to lead to us redefining what a legal death is or what the rights are at that point. Does every person who's in a persistent vegetative state have a right to be put into an fMRI to figure out if they still have conscious awareness? And if they do, are we going to ask them if they want the machines turned off? How are we going to test competency in that population? 
How are we going to test or even understand what conscious awareness means? And does that matter to us? Is conscious awareness the marker of all things? These studies in consciousness are happening across the board, whether it's in people who are in a persistent vegetative state or monks who meditate, because we're able to see some differences between internal awareness of self and external awareness because they're experts at being able to disaggregate internal self-perception versus external perception of the world. And maybe that helps us to start to see the differences between neural signatures of awareness and neural signatures of conscious awareness. And maybe that starts to give us a better sense of who we are as people. And that's one of the things that's incredibly exciting to a lot of people, particularly consumers out there in the world of neuroscience, is is neuroscience going to finally help us understand who we are? Is it finally going to help us look internally and unlock the black box of who we are? Which brings us to this last issue of self-access and self-determination. This is Muse. I have this one. It's one of these fun little consumer EEG devices that supposedly tell you if you have uh, focus or if you can meditate. And it's supposed to be a quick little hack to being able to focus and meditate through neurofeedback. Okay, and they're based on you know, simple models right now of EEG. They're single electrode leads. The um, Muse has five electrode leads. They have some programs which are supposed to lead to things like neurofeedback. And this is just one of the devices. They're dry electrode leads. Um, and the signals are okay, not great. But what is it that we can actually tell from EEG? Well, they claim a lot. But what can we really tell? Okay, and how focused am I really? And is that really what the measure of focus is? And what does that even mean? These are leading to interesting questions. And of course, this is just reading. I also have the focus TDCS. Frightening. I've only used it once, so for those of you who are thinking, oh gosh, like get that out of her hands, <laughs> I'm not going to fry my brain, I promise, but other people will. They will fry their brains, and we have no idea what the long-term consequences are. We have no idea what the long-term consequences of using transcranial direct current stimulation or TENS units or anything else they're putting into the hands of people. Of course, we don't know what the, some of the long-term consequences of are the different smart drugs people are using or caffeine or other types of things that are being used for cognitive enhancement. And what rights do individuals have to access that information? And what if we really could learn a lot? How many of you wear something like Fitbit or another kind of fitness tracker or other types of device? Just a couple of you, a few of you. Yeah, well, Apple would have you all be putting that data into your iPhone so that they could capture information about where you are, how you're feeling, and everything else about you. So will our Google overlords, right? Um, but what if we could start doing this by having everybody wear EEG devices? And what if it actually got good? What if it got to the point where we could pick up some real-time information that was kind of powerful and useful? Who could hack into it, and what could they use? This is causing some interesting questions of constitutional law because a lot of our pre-existing procedural protections for individuals, things like the right against unreasonable search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, or the privilege against self-incrimination under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, none of those contemplated a world in which non-invasively we could get a lot of information from you and from your body without you having to speak a word. All of this contemplated a, wor a world in which you would have to speak in order to be implicated. But if we could start to reconstruct visual imagery from your brain, forget the EEG for a moment, imagine that we can do this through fMRI, which we can in some ways with a cooperative subject, can we use that information against you in a criminal case? What privileges do you have that might protect you against that? Which is causing us to ask questions like, is there such a thing as mental privacy? It seems like we don't have privacy in any other context. It seems like all of the data that we generate every day is free for use and interpretation. Is there mental privacy or is there at least something like freedom of thought? The last bastion of freedom, the last place that you hope that you have some personal repose is in your thinking. Okay? The only way we could have freedom of speech is if there was such a thing called freedom of thought. If we were able to actually access people's thoughts, if I knew what all of you were thinking, if your spouse knew what you were thinking at all times of day, Relationships would, well, <laughs> at least mine would be in serious trouble. <laughs> and so 
we hope that there's going to be some sort of concept of freedom of thought, but there isn't one yet recognized, and neuroscience is pushing us to start to ask these questions like, should there be? Is there at least somewhere that we should have some space for repose? And to what extent can you tinker with yourself? 23andMe, the direct-to-consumer genetic testing company, was partially shut down by the FDA for making claims that brought in publicly available information about the association between um, different SNP variants and supposed health consequences in the world. They weren't creating most of this data, although they were creating some, they were simply aggregating information. Is an EEG device a medical device that the FDA is going to similarly regulate and require pre-market approval? Is a TDCS going to finally end up with some sort of medical device regulation? Is there some right to take drugs that enhance yourself? Is there some right to neurofeedback techniques? Is there some right to be able to tinker with your brain? We've given you some rights to do so already. You can drink caffeine to amp yourself up. You can drink wine to diminish yourself. But which ones will be included and which ones won't? When are we going to draw the line and when won't we? And do you have any sort of cognitive freedom that will permit you to do so? Are there things that we can do without your consent? Advertising is really not with your consent, and it does impact your brain. What's the limits of what you can and can't do? What's the limits of how you can manipulate a person's brain? And how are we going to figure out risk and benefit in a world in which benefit may be very different than what we thought of before? And risk might be much more longer term than what we ever contemplated. If you start to stimulate a particular region of your brain, which leads to another region of your brain not getting as much activity or reduction in activity, and you're a child who's developing over time, and your parent wants you to do better in some particular task, and they don't care about how your personality would develop otherwise, is that a risk? Is that a risk that the FDA is going to take into account? Is that a risk that we as a society are going to take into account? What about the benefits? Anytime you have something that's enhancement-based, it's hard to figure out exactly how to weigh that against a benefit or a risk. Right? So how, what is the benefit of enhancement above normal? And how do you weigh that against any risk? Is it something that's left up to individuals personally to decide? Is it something that we're going to leave open to society to decide? Where are we going to draw the line around these new types of technologies? This is just a tiny insight into the many different types of questions people are asking. And just some of the different types of issues we're going to have to ask around developing neurotechnologies. Whether it's in the criminal courtroom or in the civil courtroom, whether it's in informing legislation, whether it's for consumer-based devices, all of this is forcing us to ask questions about who are we? And what is conscious awareness? And what is the benefit of neuroscience? Is it the objective truth? Is it the holy grail? Have we finally found it? Or are we still searching, and do we need to recognize that there are limitations to science, there are limitations to the science in its stage that it's in right now, that incorporating it too quickly into making grave decisions can be problematic, that it can undercut the credibility of the science, that it can lead us down the wrong path, that it can lead us to making harsh decisions, like putting people away for much longer than we otherwise would and than we otherwise should. These are all challenging questions, and there are so many more. People who are studying in the field of the intersection of law and neuroscience and ethics have just started to scratch the surface, just like many of you have just started to scratch the surface with neuroscience. But I would encourage you to be part of those conversations. The only way that this can be an informed debate going forward, the only way that we can ensure that what's happening in the progress of the science and in the progress of our social institutions is if there's a dialogue that's happening between neuroscientists and ethicists and legal scholars and philosophers, if we can make this a truly interdisciplinary effort where people are actually starting to inform the conversation on all sides. Too often, neuroscientists will say to me that they don't want to be part of a court case or they don't want to be part of a legislative process because their science is misunderstood. And my answer is, that's exactly right. That's why you have to be part of the process. I think we have a few minutes for questions, and I thank you for your attention. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.